Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. It is October, and in the spirit of Oktoberfest, I've decided to do a couple of episodes focused on German records. Now, whether your ancestors are from Germany or not, uh, hopefully you'll get a lot out of today's presentation. Because while we'll be using the Hamburg passenger lists as an example, the topic for today is actually about image first collections. Now let me explain just a little bit what I mean by that. Ancestry.com digitizes millions of records all at a constant rate. <laughs> um, we have digitization uh, setups all over the world. Basically what that means is that we take either microfilm, microfiche, or original paper records, either bound or unbound, and we create digital images out of those using cameras and digitization equipment. Now, as you can imagine, um, digitizing something from microfilm is really fast <laughs> and fairly inexpensive, or at least relatively inexpensive. Digitizing something that's an original document, particularly if it's a very, very old original document, requires a lot more care and handling and an actual person has to be involved in turning the page and making sure that that digital image gets created. And so it's a little bit more time consuming and quite a bit more expensive. Now, even with all of that said, the process of indexing, which means we take that digital image, a person actually reads each record on that image and types in what they see to create a searchable index. So that process of indexing is actually one of the more expensive pieces of that process. So Ancestry.com is creating digital images really fast and we're creating indexes as quickly as possible. But the rate at which images are being created sometimes outpaces the rate at which those indexes are being created. So we made a decision as a company that we weren't going to make you wait <laughs> for those images until those indexes were completed. That's one thing. The second thing is, is that um, every time we acquire a set of content or certain kinds of records, um, we have agreements with the archives or library or repository who holds those records. And those agreements are different based on our relationship with them and our negotiations with them. Sometimes they allow us to do things and sometimes they don't. And that's just how that relationship plays out with that particular government or archive. So there are, with that said, with those two issues, there are records on Ancestry.com that will never show up in search because there is no index that has been created. So what we're gonna talk about today is mostly where you're gonna find those image first collections and how you can still use them to further your family history. Hopefully with that much of an introduction, you have an idea of where I'm coming from, so let's dive in. Okay, um, Hamburg Passenger List is one of, as I mentioned, the um, image first collections that we have online. We have several other major image first collections. Um, one is Italian civil registration. So for many years we digitized records in Italy um, at the town level and we've created databases or complete image collections full of Italian civil registration. But only a very few of those have been indexed. So those are a major source of just image first records. The third major source of image first collections on Ancestry.com are the Swedish church records. This huge database of records that in some cases date back hundreds of years and they are image first. Now, let me just, um, I'm gonna use a word <laughs> quite repeatedly and I just wanna make sure you know what it means. That image, that word is browse, which just means basically um, that when you find these image first collections, you need to recognize that you're not searching. Um, you're going to find them by using the card catalog and what you're going to do is browse them just like you would a reel of microfilm, image by image by image. Some of you may have done this with the 1940 census before the index was complete. So hopefully you're a little bit familiar with the process. Or maybe you have been doing genealogy for a while or you used to do it a long time ago and now you're coming back to it and you remember the days of microfilm where you would have to go image by image. 
It's the same concept here, only instead of scrolling with your, with your little turner on your microfilm reader, you're actually just clicking through um, images on your computer screen. Okay, so those are kind of the concepts around how these collections work. So let's hop over here to Ancestry.com. Somebody asked me the other day, why would I ever want to use the card catalog if I can just search um, and have stuff come up? Well, this is one reason why the card catalog is so very useful. So if you haven't been introduced to the card catalog, you're going to find it under search. These are hover buttons, so I'm not going to click. I'm just going to move my mouse over these buttons, and you'll see these little drop-down boxes come up. Hover over search, and card catalog is the very bottom thing, and then I can click on that. You'll see here Ancestry.com has over 30,994 databases here. I mean, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> over here on the right or the left-hand side, you have filters. There are three filters for the card catalog. One is record type or collection. One is location. And then down here below location, you're going to see um, date and, well, actually there's four, date and language. Sometimes when I use the location, the language goes away, so I forgot about it. Um, under date, you can filter by century or by decade. So for example, if I wanted to see what records were available on Ancestry.com for Germany, and I was specifically interested in immigration records from Germany, just with those couple of clicks, I now have 30 databases of possibilities to look at. So that's why I use the, that's why I use the card catalog. I want to see what does Ancestry.com even have online? What is available? What's possible? Now, when we start talking about these image first collections, what this does is when you find a collection and you click on it, you're going to discover that sometimes there is not a search box. Now, in the case of the Hamburg passenger list, there is, but I'm going to read this tiny print right here because you might not be able to see it on your screen. So if you'll notice up here, this database is Hamburg passenger lists. Just so you know, these are actually outbound passenger lists. So it's not the people coming into Hamburg, it's the people leaving Hamburg. So your ancestor may not have even been from Germany, but they may have gone to the port of Hamburg to um, emigrate um, out of Europe and to come to the United States. So German or not, your ancestor could be in this particular database. So this database covers the, year, the years 1850 to 1934, okay? Now you're gonna see this. Please note that only the years 1877 to 1914 have been indexed so far. However, all of the images for 1850 to 1934 are available. If you do not find your ancestors in a search by name, or if you know for a fact that they came um, either before 1877 or after 1914, try browsing the images by year. And then it gives us this interesting little piece of information. It says you may want to begin by browsing the handwritten indexes. And then there's a little link where we can click to, to look at the indexes that are handwritten. Let's talk about these handwritten indexes for just a minute. There's this big database description, as there is with all databases, that kind of explains a little bit about it, but here's the high level of this. The German government actually had a work program whereby people created indexes from the Hamburg passenger lists. They were hand, they're handwritten indexes. Basically, people were given a year. So you'll notice there's this range of years here over in the browse. No search box here, right? Just this browse feature over here on the right-hand side. So these are broken down by year ranges. You'll notice some say direct and some say indirect. When, I don't know why this is, it just kind of is. When you fly um, from one place to another, one of the things you may have noticed is that if you fly direct, it's a little bit more expensive. But if you fly indirect, meaning you make a stop somewhere or change planes somewhere, it's less expensive. That has always been the case with travel. Like I said, it makes no sense to me. You would think that the more places you had to stop, the more expensive, but whatever. So, um, but depending on what you may or may not know about your ancestors' financial circumstances, 
Um, that might give you an idea of where to start, whether direct or indirect. If you don't know, you'll have to check both categories. So we're going to start with this 1855 to 1910 indirect. And then you'll notice it just breaks it down a little bit further and a little bit further as we go through what we call this browse structure. So now I have this whole list um, of, uh, of dates within that original date range. So the original date range was huge, 1855 to 1910. Now it breaks it down a little bit further, in some cases down to a series of months. So if you have a general idea of when your ancestor immigrated, maybe you only have to go through two or three of these. If you have no idea when your ancestor immigrated, you might have a little bit more research to do in naturalization records or other kinds of records in order to narrow that down. One of my favorite tricks is actually to look at the birth dates of, or birthplaces of children, right? If the older two children were born in Germany and the younger three children were born in the United States, then look between that second and third child as the year range for, you can even narrow it down a little bit further depending on if the father immigrated first or however that works. So use what you know um, so that you have a general idea and so that you don't have to look at every single one of these, okay? But once you narrow it down to a particular um, time period or two or three, then you'll notice that the next browse level that comes up has to do with surname of the alphabet, um, the surname letter. So I'm going to click on N here, and you'll notice that now with that much of a narrowing down, it takes me to a set of 10 images that I need to go one by one and look at, okay? Again, remember, these are the handwritten indexes that were created by, um, by the German government, and they are, they just contain a page number or a reference so that you can go back to the original passenger lists and find the actual page. People aren't written alphabetically on their passenger list, obviously. Um, and so what this does is it just says, here are all the people with an N surname. Now, one of the quirks of this is that it is not, um, what's the word? It's not empirically, it's not exactly alphabetical. It's only sectioned by surname, by the first letter of the surname. So for example, I was given the N's and I was given October of 1883 through November of 1885. And so I just went through the passenger lists chronologically and every time I came across somebody with an N surname, I would write down their information and the page they're on. So you'll see here we go from um, an N-I-G-U-D to an N-A-R-U-N-S-K-I, right? Because they're just writing down the specific um, people with the whose last names start with N as they go. Um, once you find, and then you can just advance the images here one at a time to work your way through these. Now be careful, there's some, um, because these were digitized from this original book, there's some bleed through on some of these pages that make them a little bit more difficult to, um, to read or to a little distracting with all of this noise, we call it image noise, over here on this image. Um, these are also, again, handwritten, so depending on who was doing the writing, you might have to take a few passes before your eyes become accustomed to the handwriting and you can start to read them. Um, but you just work your way through these one at a time using this image advance arrows over here on the right-hand side. Once you find um, where your ancestor is located, so in this particular case, you know, here I found... Um, Hirsch Needler, and he's going to be on image 419. Um, remember, I'm on this very specific um, time period. Now, when I go back to the Hamburg passenger lists, I can actually browse down to the specific year, um, to the specific set of, to the specific date, and then here are the actual passenger lists, and I can page through those. Um, one at a time until I find the specific image that I that it said that my ancestor was on. 
And then, of course, once you find your ancestor, and I won't go all the way through, but once you find your ancestor on that passenger list, always pay attention to who else is listed with them. A lot of times, even if they didn't travel with immediate family members, they traveled with cousins or in-laws or people from the same village as them. So they may not be a relative, but there may be clues about where specifically your ancestor was from as you look at the other people that they traveled with. One of the other things I just want to point out as you browse records, so for example, I'm on image number three. I'm looking here for a page number. It looks like these corners are pretty dark here. Um, oh, here we go. Over here, it's been there's been a little tag put on this. So I'm in volume three, A1, um, bond 47. So that's the like the microfilm reel number that I'm on. And I'm looking for a page number. Ooh, it's very faint in this upper corner here. So I can zoom in on that and figure out what that page number was. And let's say I was on page number 12 and I really need to get to page number you know, 112, then I could just type in whatever number I want up here and skip to that image. So you don't have to go one by one like a microfilm all the way through every single image. You can jump to images and then see where you're at with the page numbers here and maybe go, we're on page 211, this is image 210, you know, maybe I went a little too far, I can go back an image or two. And this back button here, this gets a little confusing for some people, is actually to go back an image. So you'll notice I just went back to 122. It's not like the back button on your browser where it takes you back to the last image you viewed. Hopefully that's clear. Some of you, I don't want any, any of you to get confused, and I know sometimes this technology stuff gets a little bit intimidating, but the back button on your browser takes you to the last image you viewed. These image buttons, this back and forward, just take you to the next or the previous image in the series, okay? So use these buttons when you're moving forward and backward through image numbers um, on the particular set of records. Again, I hope that makes sense. These Hamburg passenger lists, like I mentioned, um, if I click back here to return to browsing, I would recommend that you read the database description. It gives you some excellent information. Remember, whether your family was actually from, um, whether your family was actually from Germany or not, a lot of people departed out of Germany. Um, about two thirds of the passengers were from elsewhere, excuse me, were from elsewhere in Eastern Europe, Russia, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Romania, even some people from Southern Europe. So just because um, it's a German collection of records um, does not mean that everybody who left that particular port was of German descent. And if you haven't been able to find your ancestors on inbound passenger lists into the United States, this is a good resource to check to see if you can find them leaving Germany. Now it does require, if you're a US, uh, Ancestry.com US subscriber, these records do require a world subscription in order to view them. They're part of our German collection, um, and so they do require that. Just the last couple of things I just want to share with you. I did mention um, both Italian and Swedish records. There are actually several dozen collections that are image first, and you'll discover those as you look for what it is that you need to fill in the stories or the holes in your family history. So use this card catalog, browse maybe by location is a good place to start, um, and you know, just see what's available. The other two collections I mentioned were the Italian civil registration records. So let me just give you a peek at what those look like. So I'm gonna click on Italy. I'm gonna click on birth, marriage, and death. And you'll notice here we have 23 um, databases or collections of records uh, that contain civil registration, which is birth, marriage, and death records for various locations throughout, um, throughout Italy. I can click on any one of these. So let's um, go down here to Varese. I can click on that. You'll notice there's a little bit of search, but it's not a name-based search. So I could search for you know, all marriage records for a certain time period and then get a, get a complete set of images for that. Or I can just use the browse over here again. I can say, you know what, I wanna see what's available for Varese, and I'm not even gonna try and pronounce um, this particular town, <laughs> and then what records are available for that location. 
and what years are available for that location. And so now I come to this page that gives me whatever information is available for that particular place. When I go back to browsing, um, I can just work my way through. You know, if you know your family is from this province, but you don't know exactly what location they're from, um, maybe, you, maybe you do a few different kinds of browses to try to find the records that are available. Remember when you're browsing, one of the benefits of browsing is that it allows us to get a greater context. So you'll notice when I came to some of these, and I don't know if this is a good example, when I come to some of these, um, there's a little bit of front matter um, there's a little bit of, there's usually a tag over here um, on the side now granted these are in Italian and if you don't speak Italian that doesn't mean you cannot research in these records one of the things that I do when I'm researching in records that are in a language I do not read or or speak is I use Google Translate where I'll just copy this information directly into Google Translate to see exactly what it says I've mentioned before I also like to create a list of words that I might find in genealogy born, married, died, spouse, husband, wife, um, father, mother, like I'll just create this whole list of words, I'll plug those into Google Translate, translate them into the language of the records that I'm looking at, and then print that out and just keep a copy of that handy so that as I'm reading this record, I don't have to know what every piece of information says, I just have to know, let's zoom in here a little bit, I just have to know that matrimonio, right, means um, marriage, esposo, uh, you know, like I'm looking for some of those key words so that I know what these fields mean. Um, so that I know as I browse image by image through these if I found the correct record or not. So hopefully that gives you some insight and guidance into how to use these records. Again, use that card catalog, see what's available. If you happen to come to a specific set of records where there is no search box, that's um, gonna usually look like this. Go straight to that browse after you read that database description. Just because there is a search box um, doesn't always mean that all records have been indexed. And so like these Hamburg passenger lists, um, we've tried to give you notations or information about what has been indexed and what hasn't been indexed. And every once in a while, as you may have learned with the 1940 census, uh, sometimes it's beneficial to go ahead and browse through those records anyway so that you can see what's available um, or if you've tried searching and you're not having any success maybe you know exactly where your family happened to be living at the time and so if you can get down to that specific location um, or enumeration district in the case of a census, right? Here is the 1930 census for Green Forest, Arkansas. There's only 15 images. I can browse through those one at a time and see if I can't find my family. Maybe they were missed in the indexing or maybe the indexing was um, inaccurate because of some handwriting issues or whatever, and maybe this will help me find them a little bit better. So remember, um, Image first collections will never surface in search results because no searchable index has been created yet. Um, you're gonna find them by using the card catalog and you're going to browse them like you would a reel of microfilm. That's all I have for you today. Hopefully this was helpful information. If you have questions, I will be available on search. If you're watching this live, I'll be available on chat um, immediately following the presentation. If you're watching an archived version of this on YouTube, feel free to leave a comment. I do monitor those. If you have questions um, or think that there's more that needs to be addressed, or if you have other topics you would like discussed, you can email me at ask at ancestry.com. I do read all of those emails. I don't respond to them um, individually, but I do use your questions and challenges and research problems to craft these presentations. I want you to be successful in your family history, and so that's why I spend the time and effort to do these. You can check our uh, Facebook page, if you go there and click on the events tab, you're going to see that we've got the whole calendar of events for the month of October already online. You can see what interests you. RSVP for those so that you get a little reminder when the time comes. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.